Hello YouTube! Since ancient times uh, mankind has been searching for the so-called promised land, uh, people of faith have their beliefs. And those who believe in the esoteric, they view that land as a such promised land. And other places of power, mystery, mysticism, and new knowledge. And in the 19th century mankind found a new object to search for, Shambhala. And I know that my audience knows about Shambhala and in the future I will talk about the one in Tibet based on the Russian sources of course. But today I want to talk about something else. Now Shambhala was first heard of in Europe and uh, brought, the news was brought by the Jesuits in the year of 1627. These monks went around Asia telling the inhabitants about uh, Jesus but the locals replied that they have a place where the great teachers stay, Shambhala, and show the Jesuits the direction of the north. The mysterious Shambhala was searched for in the Himalayas, the Gobi Desert and the Pamir Mountains, but not in Russia. Now, in my books, writing about the Tangaska phenomenon of 1908, I mentioned one insightful Russian author who, as a government official at the time, led one of the first expeditions to the site of the alleged crash. Well, the same writer, Vyacheslav Shishkov, a well-known researcher of Siberia and author of the wonderful book Ugrim River, he wrote down many Siberian legends. So here's one of them. And it goes like this. There is such a strange country in the world, it is called Belovodia. And songs about it are sung and fairy tales told of this place. It is in Siberia or beyond Siberia or somewhere else. You have to pass through the steppes, mountains, eternal taiga, all toward sunrise, to the sun, to guide your way. And if you are granted happiness from birth, you will see Belovodya yourself. The land in it is rich, the soil. The rains are warm, the sun, sun is fertile, wheat grows all year round by itself. Uh, no need to either plow or uh, put seeds in the ground, apples, watermelons, grapes, and in the flowery endless big grass countless er herds graze. Come and take and own it. And this country does not belong to anyone. All the freedom, all the truth lives in it from time immemorial. And this country is amazing. In Russian, Belovodya means white waters. Um, modern esoterics claim that it is in Belovodya that the entrance to the mysterious Shambhala is located. Altai shamans guard the peace of Shambhala. Due to the large number of ubiquitous tourists, shamans all often must restore the energy level of this zone. Now, that famous Russian artist, traveler and seeker of Shambhala, Nicholas Rorik, in his works, he sang praises to the mountain Beluka and its unique surroundings. Now, but the main goal of any trip to the Altai Mountains is still considered to be the path of self-determination or self-realization. Old timers tell an about an unusual stone in the Yarlu River Valley in the Altai. It is called the Stone of Power because it has the strongest energy and gradually increases in size. The stone has a mystical aura so shamans perform rituals near it and yogis have chosen this place for their meditations. The stone shows an ancient symbol, a circle with three circles in the center. But it is not only the Altai Republic that has attracted seekers of the mysterious Shambhala. In Russia there are many legends about a certain holy land located in Siberia. This place, like the legendary sunken city of Kitej in Russia has remained invisible and inaccessible to the forces of evil for centuries. The legend of the fortunate land of the righteous has survived for many centuries. It was known in Byzantine. 
than in old Russian and Western medieval literature. So, in the chronicles stored in the ancient Vyshensk Uspensky monastery in the Tambov region of Russia, there is a wonderful story about how during the reign of Prince Vladimir of Kiev, a monk uh, by the name of Sergei, who spent several years in Byzantine monasteries, returned to Kiev and told the prince a legend about a mysterious land in the east, the kingdom of white waters, the country of justice and virtue. Prince Vladimir became interested in the story and asked Sergei to go at the head of a large detachment in search of Belovodya. So he equipped it, gave him soldiers, gave him uh, animals and uh, um, ammunition, provisions and so forth, and sent him on a mission. And the mission of Father Sergei who was then about 30 years old. It began in 987 AD. The prince hoped that he would return in three years. However, neither three years later nor ten years later, the detachment did not return. Then the prince decided that in distant lands, travelers, his detachment, suffered an evil fate, and in time they were forgotten. But one day, in 1043 AD, a very old man appeared in Kiev, and he declared himself to be the monk Sergei, the same one who was dispatched by the late Prince Vladimir in search of a wonderful eastern country. And the newcomer told the amazed listeners an astounding but quite reliable story about his long journey to Belovodya. Father Sergei said that by the end of the second year of the journey, many of his comrades died of diseases and the animals fell. The rest of the detachment came to a vast desert dotted with many skeletons of people, horses, camels and donkeys. Many of Sergei's companions were broken by the strenuous journey and refused to go any further. Only two, the most courageous and tough, agreed to continue the journey. By the end of the third year, this too, barely alive from misery and disease, had to be left in an oasis in the care of local residents. Father Sergei himself was on the verge of complete exhaustion, but he cut off the chance to turn back. Either reach the goal or die. There is no other way. This is the Russian character for you. Of course, not all Russians are like that, but there are some. Three months later, the monk reached, as it seemed to him, the borders of Belovodya, a lake with salt, white shores. Here his guide refused to go any further, feeling mysteriously frightened. But Father Sergei still moved deep into the forbidden territory. After several days of traveling, two people suddenly appeared in front of the haggard monk. They took him to a village where he could rest and then he got a job and learned many crafts. People of various tribes lived and worked near it. What, of, what kind of country it was and where it was located, Sergei did not know exactly. Having lived safely, safely for many years there, he once fell asleep and woke up far beyond its borders. And soon, due to wonderful circumstances, he was able to return home to Kiev. It is possible that since the time of Prince Vladimir in Russia, uh, there was a belief in the kingdom of Belovodya. Well, turns out that yes, Nicholas Przewalski, an outstanding researcher of Central Asia, mentions in the description of his expeditions that around 1860, 130 old believers from the Altai rich Lake Lobnor to the Tibetan borders. That's where they went, in search of the promised land of Belavodya. The old believers were uh, so-called religious dissenters after uh, the reforms of the church by Tsar uh, Peter the Great. And by the way, Brzewalski's, uh, I understand that not all, all of Brzewalski's papers and diaries have been declassified, and some of them we just don't have any access to. And he has gone deep into Central Asia and had many interesting observations. 
but we'll talk about it one other day. Well, since then, legends about the mysterious Belavodya have stirred the minds of numerous seekers and pilgrims. It is possible that the influence of Tibetan Shambhala extended to, it, to the territory of Russia, even despite the long distance and numerous obstacles. Therefore, it is quite possible that this utopia was located on the territory of Russia, in a remote place somewhere, on the border of Siberia and the mountainous regions of Asia. The sages or teachers of this mystical settlement are considered supreme beings by some. Called Mahatmas or Great Souls, uh, they were revered in Tibet and India. According to Eastern beliefs, Mahatmas had mysterious abilities and considered, uh, consisted of those who passed the path of terrestrial evolution. Let's just say went beyond it. But for the sake of preserving the Earth, they remained on our planet. It is assumed that at least two of the Russian people in the 20th century visited the mysterious country Belovodya. They were Nicholas Rorik and his wife Yelena Rorik. But there are also researchers who believe that the couple uh, were KGB agents involved in international conflict over Tibet between the communists in Moscow and, and the British Empire. The Rorix managed to reach the legendary abode of truth and light, the mysterious Shambhala. By the way, the expedition was under the American flag. It was a very complicated <coughs> set of events. And we won't go into them now, I described them in some other videos, but it was an interesting uh, expedition. In 1925, Nicholas Rorik gave the message of the Tibetan Mahatmas to the authorities in Moscow. And in the 1930s, the Rorik's returned to India and lived in the foothills of the Himalayas for the rest of their lives. And in doing so, probably saved their lives because in the Soviet Union they would surely be imprisoned or worse during the Great Purge under Stalin when he destroyed his own agents and spies and uh, so forth. It's not nice to say so forth, of course, about the people uh, that were killed and um, I don't hold too much pity for the communists but uh, it's not pleasant to have Stalin's in any land. During this period, Nicholas Yorick's work acquired a new and more perfect direction, and his wife became famous for numerous works in the field of culture and philosophy. Many books, articles, and paintings by Nicholas Yorick relate to Tibet and the mysterious knowledge of the teachers of mankind. And in Yelena Yorick's new mystical and philosophical teaching, Agni Yoga, she directly points to the connection of their family with the Tibetan Mahatmas. Now, many people knew about the Tibetan Shambhala, but there was practically no information about the Russian Shambhala located in Belavodya. It turned out that to get to the mystical Shambhala, or Shambhala, it was not necessary to travel beyond the three seas. Actually, the land of truth and light is very close. Well, it is possible it is impossible not to recall another super mysterious place in Russia when mentioning the mysterious Shambhala. We're talking about the Lake Svetlayar in the Nizhny Novgorod region. Experts believe that the lake has a glacial karst origin. A long time ago, because of an earthquake, the depth of the lake increased to 25.5 meters. The following definition was secured for the lake the pearl of the overturned sky in the green frame of the forest. Near this lake, chrono mirage or time mirage are often observed, including the reflection of the domes of the temples of the mysterious city of Kiddish and the sounds of bells. There are many interesting legends about Svetlayar. The legend of the evil goddess Turka is transmitted since pagan times. The goddess rode a dashing horse, forcing people to move in front of her, and uh, she would whip those uh, people for their sins. 
but suddenly the ground under her horse collapsed and the goddess fell into the ground instantaneously and in this place appeared a lake. The second legend refers to the time of Batu, the great Mongolian warlord, descendant of Genghis Khan. One of the captives could not stand the tortures to which the Mongol invaders subjected him and revealed to them secret paths. But the higher power heard the prayers of the inhabitants of Kitish and concealed the city along with the people at the bottom of a beautiful lake and uh, denied the Mongol invaders fruits of their invasion. Well, some Russian researchers consider Lake Svetlayar to be the Shambhala of Russia. It was here that a pink purple UFO was seen flying over the lake and it had the form of a falling leaf. And in 1996, eyewitnesses told about two rays coming out from different ends of the lake and forming a luminous or shining cross. Residents in the area believe that the lake water has healing properties. And then there is Tuva. In this Russian Republic of Tuva, there is even the village of Shambalig and the fortress of Porbazhin on an island in the middle of Lake Terehol. And it's, it's called by some people the Gates to Shambhala. Famous writer of Tuva, Sherlik Ul Kular, referring to the stories of the old timers of a small village or Sumona, Shambalig, spoke about ancient traditions that connect this territory with a blessed sacred place that has been inhabited since ancient times. Officially, the Suomon appeared on the map of the USSR in the 1960s of the last century, of course, and now about 600 residents live in the Shamba League. According to folk legends, Lamas, or the holy people, lived in the place where Shamba League is now located in ancient times. One old timer, Ava Amon Gush, actually he was the former uh, first secretary of the District Communist Party committee of the Erza district, that was in the Soviet times. He explained to that local author Kuolo R that the location of Shambalik is really very good. The land here is fertile with a good climate. Well, remember descriptions uh, from Siberia in that legend? Today the Shambalik area is one of the tourist attractions of Tuva and guests of the Republic are willing to visit it. Not far from Sumon is a religious building called Buddhist Mortar. A local shaman Rosa Nasik Dorju shows everyone a meter long stone that looks like a human footprint, the so called footprint of Buddha, and tells ancient, ancient legends that one of the entrances to Shambhala is located in this place. And now we have to look at Por Bajin, or the gate to paradise. High in the mountains of southern Siberia, on a small island in the center of Lake Terra, are ruins of a very strange and mysterious fortress, Por Bajin, a really unusual place. Located near the Mongolian border, the fortress has been known since the 18th century, but was not explored until the late 19th century. The name Por Bajin means clay house in Tuvan. This complex still fascinates and at the same time upsets numerous experts who are still unable to determine who built it and why. This ancient fortress, again, uh, archaeologists, uh, they dated to, the, to, to different centuries, some to the 13th century, some to others, with an area of 3.5 hectares, was first opened to the scientific community in 1891 by a Russian ethnographer and archaeologist Dmitry Clements. He noticed the similarity between the fortress of Por Bajin and a similar structure in the former capital of the Uyghur Empire, Kara Balgasun. This empire flourished for about a century between the mid 8th and the 9th centuries. Based on this discovery, the monument was dated to the same period. For the same reason, Por Bajin became known as a fortress. The first excavations at the site 
uh, took place almost 60 years later by another Russian archaeologist who discovered features typical of Chinese Tang Dynasty architecture. Based on this information, the leading archaeologist of the excavation, uh, Weinstein, suggested that Fort Bajin was a defensive fortress built by the second Uyghur ruler, Boyan Shur, in, 70, in 750 AD. Weinstein's hypothesis was soon accepted by other investigators, even though it is, was based solely on speculation. There wasn't much to go on. So Soviet scientists began to explore Port Bajin in the middle of last century, and the first expedition was led by this professor Sevian Weinstein of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, since the beginning of the year 2000, archaeological work on Port Bajin has intensified, and the historical monument was included in the program uh, for, for, for the creation of a special fortress park on the site. Most likely this fortification at one time burned down during the assault, and its defenders uh, uh, before that managed to escape to a safe place, since archaeologists did not find any human remains during excavations. Uh, Tuvan shamans are convinced that poor Bajin is nothing more than the nord northern underground entrance to Shambhala. In 2007, large-scale field research was undertaken by the Russian Academy of Sciences, the State Oriental Museum, visit it if you, if you have a chance, if you're in Russia, and the Moscow State University. Archaeologists found numerous artifacts, but none of them could clearly confirm the reason and the time of construction of the structure. Another mystery is the absence of traces of housing. Thanks to modern, modern radiocarbon analysis, it was possible to determine that the fortress was built between 770 and 790 AD, which is 20 to 30 years later than the original date. And since Boyan Shur died in 759, the fortress most likely could have been built by his son, Begu Kagan, who declared Manichaeism the state religion. He may have founded Por Bajin as a monastery of Manichaeism, which explains the uh, isolation. Begu Kagan was killed in 779 during the anti manichaean uprising, which explains the lack of traces of housing. The monastery never started functioning, but there is no evidence to support any of the versions. Manichaeism was a major religion founded in the 3rd century, uh, century AD by a Persian prophet Mani of the Sasanian Empire. Manichaeism taught an elaborate dualistic cosmology describing the struggle between a good spiritual world of light and an evil material world of darkness. Through an ongoing process that takes place in human history, light is gradually removed from the world of matter and returned to the world of light, whence it came. Its beliefs uh, were based on local uh, Mesopotamian religious movements and Gnosticism. Manichaeism was quickly successful and spread far to the Aramaic-speaking regions. It thrived between the 3rd and the 7th centuries, and at its height was one of the most widespread religions in the world. Manichaean churches and scriptures existed as far east as China, and as far west as the Roman Empire. The future of poor Bajin is actually under threat. The structure is built on layers of permafrost, slowly mel melting over the past century because of warmer temperatures. As the ice melts, the water level rises and the ruins may soon be absorbed by the lake. According to one of the researchers, this could happen in about 80 years. There is also evidence of damage caused by at least two earthquakes in the past. One of them occurred during the construction in the 8th century, and another one a few centuries later. And it was the one that actually destroyed poor Bajin, from what we know. Well, where else in the USSR were they looking for Shambhala? In my previous videos, I described the special department of the OGPU, that's how the KGB was called at the time, engaged in paranormal research and I described its uh, consultant 
Barchenko. Alexander Barchenko, an employee of the Special Department of the KGB, visited Altai in the early 1930s as part of a special expedition. According to uh, various sources, uh, they are not documented, we, we, we have an idea where the documents are kept, but there, there is no access to them. Well, he brought a map of the entrance to Shambhala from, from, from the Altai region, which he visited. In the materials of the criminal case initiated in 1937 against Barchenko on charges of creating a counter-revolutionary organization, uh, there is a mention of Shambhala in the name of this anti-Soviet group. Uh, the Special Department of the KGB, initially created to protect state secrets from foreign spies, was also engaged in the search for ancient civilizations and the territory of the USSR, in particular Hy Hyperborea. And in 1937 this unit was radically cleaned up, and the head of it, Gleb Boki, and most of his uh, subordinates, including Alexander Barchenko, were executed. Uh, there is no information that any official attempts to find Shambhala were made on the territory of the USSR in the following decades. However, according to Dalai Lama uh, 14th, not everyone can see it. it. If only the karma and mind of a person are pure, then there is a chance to discover a mysterious country of paradise and for others it will remain a secret behind seven seals. So that's what I wanted to tell you about the quest for the Russian Shambhala and I'll tell you about the other Shambhala in my uh, future videos. I appreciate your support and if you can help my research there are links in the description section to this video and I will tell you more in the future videos. Thank you!